Our story begins with Osman, a young prince who was known and praised for his religious piety. Osman was chief of his tribe after the death of his father, leader of the Turkic Kaya tribe that had fled from Central Asia, fleeing the Mongolian onslaught. Osman began to visit a holy man, the Sheikh Edebali, out of respect for his purity and learning. They met at a small village named Ikbornu. One evening, after he had accidentally seen his beautiful daughter, Mal Hatun, Osman's visits became more frequent. He confessed his love, but Edebali thought that the social gap between the two, he a lowly tribal leader, she the daughter of a great holy man, made the marriage unwise and refused to give consent. One night when Osman was resting at Edebali's house, because in those times, shelter could never be denied to anyone, even to a suitor whose attempts were being rejected, the young prince, in a state of sorrow, fell asleep. At this time, he dreamed a dream. Osman saw himself and Edebali near each other. From the bosom of Edebali rose the full moon, and inclining towards the bosom of Osman, it sank upon it and was lost to sight. After that, a tree sprang forth, which grew in beauty and in strength, growing greater and greater. The branches spread out and cast ampler and ampler shade until they covered the extreme horizon of the three parts of the world. Under the tree stood four mountain ranges, which he knew to be the Caucasus, the Atlas, the Taurus, and the Hamus. These mountains were the four columns that seemed to support the dome of the foliage of the tree with which the earth was now centered. From the roots of the tree gushed four rivers, the Tigris, the Euphrates, the Danube, and the Nile. Tall ships innumerable were on the waters. The fields were heavy with harvest. The mountains were clothed with forests. Fountains sprang forward, and Osman could see in the valleys glittering stately cities with domes and cupolas, with pyramids and obelisks, with minarets and towers. The crescent shone on their summits, and from the galleries he could hear the call to prayer. The sound was mingled with the sweet voices of a thousand nightingales and with the prattling of countless parrots. Every kind of singing bird was there. The multitude of birds flitted around beneath the living roof of the interlacing branches of the massive tree that covered the world, and every leaf of that tree was shaped like a sword. Suddenly there arose a great wind and turned the points of the sword leaves toward the various cities of the world, but especially towards Constantinople. That city, placed at the center of two seas and two continents, seemed like a diamond set between two sapphires and two emeralds to form the most precious stone in a ring of universal empire. Osman thought that he was in the act of placing that ring on his finger when he woke up. That's the story of Osman's dream, the legendary account of how this small chieftain, who in the late 13th century became an independent ruler, and his sons grew this tiny state into an empire that grew and grew and grew. Osman told this dream to his host, and the vision seemed to Edebali so clearly to indicate honor, power, and glory to the children of Osman and Malhatun that the sheikh no longer opposed their marriage. Well, this dream of Osman's is the mythological story relating to the life of the founder of the Ottoman Empire. This dream is a metaphorical vision predicting the growth and power of his empire to be ruled by him and his descendants. This story came about in the 15th century, more than 100 years after the death of Osman. Many believe that this story was invented to predict its incredible success, to show that God himself had favor on Osman, and the prosperity he would bring to his empire and all of his conquests. Osman was the first sultan in a dynasty that lasted for more than 600 years, from 1300 to 1923. To Ottomans, he is what Romulus is to the Romans. He's a legendary founding figure of an incredibly successful political community in a land where he was not one of the indigenous people. And much like the Roman Empire, which began as a peripheral area of the Greek world and eventually rose to the center of the Greco-Roman world, 
The Ottoman Empire rose from a small chieftainship at the edge of Islamic civilization and eventually became a superpower that much enlarged the Islamic world. Much like the Romans, too, it began as a warrior state, but then became an administrative state, and maybe wasn't the most intellectual or philosophical empire, but it deployed power like no other. So the Ottomans can be considered the Romans of the Muslim world. Well, this description of the mythological beginning of Osman kicks off a series that we're going to be doing for the History Unplugged podcast premium members, and that's called Ottoman Lives. We're going to be looking at the cast of characters that make up the Ottoman Empire. In this first episode, we're going to be looking at the figure of the Sultan. We'll talk about Osman I, then we'll jump forward 200 years to look at Suleiman the Magnificent, the 10th Sultan, and the Sultan who controlled the empire at the absolute height of its power, Then we'll jump forward more than 300 years later to Abdul Hamid II, who ruled in the 1800s, who was sultan as the Ottoman Empire tried to modernize itself into a European nation state, while at the same time acting as the protector of all Muslims and handling these challenges and dueling identities. In later episodes, we're going to be looking at other figures who made up the Ottoman Empire, the peasant, the eunuch, the concubine, the soldier, the holy man, and lastly, the outlaw. Now, the reason I'm looking at the Ottoman Empire is because my research background is the Ottoman Empire. I focus on the 19th century for my doctoral research work. But beyond just my personal background, I think the Ottoman Empire has a lot to offer. History buffs don't know it as well as the Roman Empire or medieval or modern European history. They think of the Ottoman Empire as something outside of Europe. And in many ways, it was. It didn't share the religion of many Europeans historically. It was an Islamic empire, while Europe was Christian for the most part. The intellectual traditions were different. The Greco-Roman intellectual traditions weren't passed on to the Ottoman Empire in the same way. But what I love about the Ottoman Empire is that it's so entangled with European civilization that it shares many things that we would never expect to see, but it's different enough that you can look at historical issues with a fresh perspective. I've done many episodes on this podcast where I look at issues in Europe and then I hop over to the Ottoman Empire and see how they're similar and how they're different. I did this with medicine and healthcare. I did this with prostitution and showed that prostitutes knew how to exploit loopholes in Islamic tax code and managed to get tax deductions on their brothels by registering them as religious foundations. We looked at warfare and how technologies like gunpowder, cannons, quickly spread across imperial lines. We look at travelers that go between these different empires. So the Ottoman Empire, from the standpoint of Western civilization, can seem different, but it's definitely a part of it as well. In the episode on Janissaries, you'll see that the Ottoman Empire had direct influence on classical music. Plenty of composers have Turkish marches, and things like high school and college marching bands are directly influenced by the Turks. Plus, the Ottoman Empire also gave us coffee and coffee houses. Well, let's go back into the origin of the Ottoman Empire before we look at the background of its first sultan, Osman. Most historical traditions believe that the immediate ancestors of Osman and his father and other Turks arrived in Anatolia with a huge wave of Turkish migrations from Central Asia. The first great wave happened in the 1000s when the Selçuk Turks broke the eastern Byzantine defenses of Anatolia in 1071 the Battle of Manzikert, and entered Anatolia for the first time. The second wave happened in the early 13th century with the Chinggisid onslaught. This was a daughter state of the Mongolian Empire. Once in Anatolia, Osman's forefathers would have encountered many Turkish-speaking communities. Some in cities, some settled down to agriculture. But the majority were pastoral nomads. Most, but not all of them, Muslim. And they practiced different varieties of Islam. There they would have encountered many Christians as well. From the earliest Turkish migrations to Anatolia, they were engaging in skirmishes and border war with the Byzantine Empire. In western Anatolia, there was border war going on for about four centuries, from the late 1000s until the early 1400s, when the Ottomans established unitary control. Osman took power at a time when most of Anatolia was divided among Turkish warriors, Armenian princes, 
Byzantine commanders, and even some Frankish knights arriving with the Crusades. Different adventurers would show up and enter all sorts of alliances with others that might not be part of the same ethnic or religious background. Many warriors rose up and enjoyed power and success for a few years before being displaced by somebody else. It was possible for almost anyone to be an independent leader if you were successful enough and through your legacy attracted followers who acted as a magnet and attracted others around you and created good opportunities for plunder, conquest, and creating wealth for your followers. Now, this isn't too different from the growth of other turco mongolic groups, like those led by Genghis Khan or Timur the Tatar. The Ottoman Empire grew much more slowly. But maybe that's what allowed it to last for centuries. The Great Mongolian Empire disintegrated after one century. The Ottomans slowly built up a coalition and reconstructed it in the face of different challenges. But they also built up institutions and bureaucracy and religious institutions. And that's partly why it took about seven generations from Osman I to Mehmet II, who conquered Constantinople in 1453, for the Ottomans to really be considered a true empire. There's a great story about the Ottomans realizing that they were now a global power. That's when Mehmet, after conquering Constantinople, visited Troy in the western part of Anatolia when he was reigning as the Sultan, the Khan, and the Caesar. He seems to be aware of his success, and he seems to know the story of the Trojans, and he considered himself as the spirit of the vengeful Trojans paying back the Greeks. The story goes that he stood upon the side of Troy, and the sultan is reported to have inquired about Achilles and Ajax and the rest. And then, shaking his head a little, said, It was the Greeks and Macedonians, and Thessalonians and Peloponnesians who ravaged this place in the past, and whose descendants have now, through my efforts, paid the right penalty, and after a long period of years, for their injustice to us Asiatics, at that time, and so often, in subsequent times. Again, this is a great legend, probably made up after the fact, but it says a lot about the self-identity of the Ottomans. But to really get into the life of the Ottomans and to look at the figure of the Sultan, we need to go back to Osman I, which is what we're going to do right now. We know almost nothing about Osman I. We have no written records from his life. We think he died in 1324, we don't know when he was born, and we think his father was named Erturul, but again, we don't know that. That's partly because there's so few sources surrounding his life, because he wasn't that important while he lived, but also because there is so much legend surrounding his early life that was created in later centuries that separating fact from fiction is like trying to find a historical King Arthur, when peeling away the legend from the real man is like, defluffing a mountain of cotton candy. But historians mostly agree that before 1300, Osman was simply one of many Turkic tribal leaders operating in northwestern Anatolia, near the city of Sicaria. During the first decade of the 14th century, his military tactics and good fortune allowed him to conquer important territories from the Byzantine Empire that were vulnerable and accumulate all these holdings into his own nascent empire. He was originally under the umbrella of the Selchuk Turks, this Turco-Iranian power that sort of controlled Anatolia, but was so disorganized that when Osman announced his independence, barely anyone noticed. Osman is thought to have died shortly after the conquest of Bursa, and he was succeeded by his son Orhan. Osman's success seems to have been founded on his contact with the peasant population of the countryside, and he also seems to have created a sympathetic relationship with local Byzantines. Many peasants had long been disenchanted with Byzantine rule because of their heavy taxes and not providing enough security in these violent frontier regions. Because this region was under constant attack from tribal Turkic groups, Individual populations had to establish local alliances to provide for their own security, sort of like seeking out mafia protection because the actual government isn't doing its job. Hey everyone, Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. 
I'm Scott from the History Unplugged podcast. History can be a bit of a tongue twister with its weird sounding names of people, places, and things, but it really isn't that confusing. History is the story of who we are and how we comport ourselves while soaring to victory in battles over forts, seaports, and cities that fortunately thwarted the schemes of villains and their blood sports, like the 1415 Battle of Agincourt. It's about legal battles in courts about the contortion of torts over the retorts of consorts that turned into kangaroo courts. I exhort you to listen to History Unplugged on the podcast player of your choice, and you can listen to it while wearing shirts, shorts, skirts, skorts, or jean jorts. I'm Scott from the History Unplugged podcast. History can be a bit of a tongue twister with its weird sounding names of people, places, and things, but it really isn't that confusing. History is the story of who we are and how we comport ourselves while soaring to victory in battles over forts, seaports, and cities that fortunately thwarted the schemes of villains and their blood sports, like the 1415 Battle of Agincourt. It's about legal battles in courts about the contortion of torts over the retorts of consorts that turned into kangaroo courts. I exhort you to listen to History Unplugged on the podcast player of your choice, and you can listen to it while wearing shirts, shorts, skirts, skorts, or jean jorts. Well, this is how Osman is able to establish his power in this region. He provided security to the peasant regions in exchange for some tax money. After an important victory over the Byzantine army in a district near Nicomedia in 1301, Osman assumed undisputed leadership over a large number of independent Turkic tribes. With cooperation with these tribes and local Christians, Osman launched looting raids against the countryside surrounding great Bithynian cities. Luck also allowed Osman's territories to avoid encounters with Mongols and a company sent by the Byzantine emperor, Androgos Paleologos, who tried to secure the area in 1303. So when the Byzantine peasants saw that the Byzantine empire couldn't protect them, they switched their allegiance to Osman without having to change their religion. They were Christians at this time. So historians have tried to reconstruct the nature of Osman's early government, but again, it's hard because we don't have any written documents. The two most concrete sources of information are a silver coin stamped with Osman's name, which at least tells us that he was an independent ruler, because if you mint money in your own name, then you're not under the authority of anyone else. And we also have a title deed for a religious endowment dated 1324. So the coin confirms the Ottoman tradition that Osman had declared himself as an independent ruler, and the dedication document bears the name of Osman's children, including Orhan, the future ruler, and it bears a signature of Orhan. But we also have Byzantine documents that talk about Osman. One text records his first decisive victory over the Byzantine army at Bephaeus, a district around Nicomedia, in 1301. According to the Byzantine chronicler, This was the beginning of great trouble for the whole region. It appears that by 1308, the conquest of Bellicome and neighboring fortress in the Sakarya River Valley allowed Osman to control the countryside westward as far as the Sea of Marmara. But over the centuries, Osman evolves from this simple conqueror who takes over a few small cities and small forts and gets some tax money from peasants into a mythological figure. And then you got the whole dream of Osman myth. From the 16th century onward, there are myths used by Ottoman and Western authors endowing the founder of the dynasty with exalted origins. The Osman's dream narrative shows that God himself gives him a dream that he's going to have a transcontinental empire. Plus, they stress the fact that he marries the daughter of a great religious man to show that Osman is marrying into the family of the prophet Muhammad. This myth also arrives at the same time that the Ottoman Empire is conquering the Middle East and the holy cities of Mecca and Medina in the 1500s, and they're trying to show that the family of Osman has legitimate claim to control the most holy sites of Islam. So Osman's definitely trying to marry up in this sense. But when we find accounts by other people who would have traveled in the Ottoman Empire in its early years, like Ibn Battuta, who's a famous North African explorer who goes from North Africa to the Middle East, to Russia, to China, to Indonesia, and all over the world in the early 1300s. He actually stops by Bursa, and he doesn't notice anything in particular that's all that interesting, and his account in this region says almost nothing. All he stresses is the humble origins of the Ottoman Empire, and Osman was a simple tribal nomadic leader who tried to carve out a tiny little land for himself in the border between the Byzantines and the Seljuks. Let's jump ahead to the 10th Sultan, Suleiman, 
when the Ottoman Empire is very, very different. Osman was a humble tribal leader. Suleiman is probably the most powerful ruler in Europe at this time. By the mid to late 1300s, the Ottomans had conquered the Balkans. By 1389, it conquers Kosovo. By 1453, the Ottoman Empire, with an army of over 100,000, conquers Constantinople, called at that time the still-beating heart of antiquity and a glorious city. By the early 1500s, the Ottoman Empire gets up into Central Europe, conquers Southern Hungary, and is threatening the gates of Vienna. This is Suleiman the Magnificent, a man so powerful that Martin Luther himself is considering this Turkish ruler to perhaps be the Antichrist and lead in the end of days. So let's look at the life of Suleiman, called the Magnificent by some, or also called the Lawgiver, for all the legal reforms that he does. Suleiman lived from 1494 to 1566, and he ruled from 1520 to 1566. And under his rule, the empire reached the absolute peak of its power. He was born on November 6, 1494, in the town of Trabzon on the Black Sea. At the time, his father, Sultan Selim, was governor there. Suleiman's fame is due as much to his conquests in Europe as to the splendor of his court and the propaganda that publicized his triumphs. There was so much splendor in his court that there was actually a soap opera in Turkey that describes the relationship between him and his wives and concubines, and it's really cheesy but also really entertaining. Suleiman led his armies on 13 campaigns, and spent perhaps a quarter of his reign on these campaigns. These campaigns brought Iraq and Hungary under Ottoman rule. He threatened the Habsburg capital of Vienna twice in 1529 and 1532. He won victory over the island of Rhodes in the eastern Aegean Sea and at Preveza in northwestern Greece in 1538. So this gave Ottomans control of the eastern Mediterranean, leaving only Malta and Cyprus unconquered for the time being. Later, they were conquered, turning the Mediterranean into basically an Ottoman lake. He was also a contemporary of the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V. This was Suleiman's chief antagonist, leading to an epic struggle between the two for world supremacy. And this led to strange bedfellows, where Suleiman had the reluctant ally of Francis I of France, because the two were scheming against the Holy Roman Emperor. We have lots of lavish books and poems that celebrate Suleiman's victories and pictures of festivities, and plus many masterpieces of Ottoman architecture. Many of the most famous imperial mosques that are still in Istanbul today were built and commissioned by Suleiman, and they were funded by all the money and plunder that came from his military victories. He also reformed the legal system because it was under his rule that the secular laws were compiled and systematized and harmonized with Sharia, and these law books were sent to district judges. So there's an idea that Suleiman ruled a golden age, and that after him, the Ottoman Empire fell into decline. These are simplistic historical myths that historians are still working against. But it just shows that Suleiman cast such a long shadow over the history of the Ottoman Empire that there's this idea of before Suleiman, things were going up, and then after him, things were going down. So this exaggerates Suleiman's achievements and masks his failures, but still his achievements were the result of talent, brilliance, and hard work, and he had many great advisors. Plus he had competent military leaders like Grand Admiral Hayreddin Barbarossa, who had all sorts of incredible naval victories on the Mediterranean. And his chief legal scholar, Ebu Sud Efendi, basically hammered out the legal code that would be followed in the most part for decades to come. Suleiman ascended the throne in 1520, and this signaled a major shift in Ottoman policy. His father had devoted the empire's resources to fighting the Persians on their eastern front, but Suleiman reoriented Ottoman strategy against the empire's Christian enemies. This was partly because war on the eastern front of the empire was getting too expensive and the logistics networks were being stretched too thin. And plus, the Persians used scorch-earth policies that destroyed crops and poisoned wells. So instead, Suleiman wanted to fight against the Hungarians, whom he considered weaker warriors. The Sultan's troops in the Balkans also wanted to fight these battles because they could profit economically through the spoils of war and maybe conquering new land and owning their own military fief. 
Plus, the Dev Shearmay system and the Janissary system was still functioning at full blast at this time, so he had plenty of troops to conscript. Very quickly into his reign, in 1521, when the Sultan was only 26 or 27 years old, Suleiman marched against Hungary and conquered Belgrade, the key fortress of the Hungarian border defense system along the lower Danube River. The next year, Suleiman's navy set sail against the island of Rhodes, capturing the fortress and evicting the Knights of St. John from the island to Malta. Suleiman succeeded where previous sultans had failed. The Ottomans had failed to capture Belgrade in 1456 and Rhodes in 1480, and these failures happened under the command of Mehmet II, the sultan who conquered Constantinople. The Suleiman was already setting himself apart from his predecessors. Suleiman achieved his greatest victory in 1526 at the Battle of Mohac in southern Hungary. His armies crushed the Hungarians and killed their king, Louis II. And through this victory, Suleiman was able to get himself into European politics and wedge between other rulers. Charles V defeated and captured Francis I at the Battle of Pavia in northern Italy in 1525. So the French king sought Suleiman's help. Suleiman chose to inflict harm on the Habsburgs through Hungary, whose king, Louis II, was the brother-in-law of Habsburg, Ferdinand, and Charles V. So for Suleiman, Francis's plea for help served as a pretext to divide the Europeans. You can see how messy European politics are at this time, and Suleiman was able to exploit these differences and divisions masterfully. Suleiman tried again and again to conquer Hungary but he was unable to capture the capital of Vienna in 1529 and 1532. Eventually, in 1541, Suleiman was able to capture the city of Buda, or Budapest, and incorporate central Hungary into the Ottoman Empire. Suleiman's 1543 Hungarian campaign established a protective ring around Ottoman Buda, the center of a newly created Ottoman province right in the heart of Central Europe. In the coming years, local Ottoman forces expanded the territories under Istanbul's control and forced the Habsburgs to conclude a five-year peace treaty with Suleiman in 1547, so they accepted the status quo. Other fortresses were captured, and the Ottomans remained in Central Europe for the next 100 to 150 years until they were finally ejected. And you can still see tombs of Turkish saints and other figures in Budapest today. Well, in addition to the Sultan's land campaigns in Europe, His naval fleet also battled the Habsburgs and their allies in the Mediterranean. The Ottoman navy was strengthened after Suleiman appointed Hydretin Barbarossa, an experienced pirate and governor of North Africa, as his grand admiral. Barbarossa conquered Tunis in 1533, but Charles V retook the city two years later. But the Ottoman admiral won a victory at Preveza in 1538 in Greece, against Charles' joint naval forces of Spain and Venice. In 1551, Suleiman's other admiral, Torgut Rais, took Tripoli from the Knights of St. John of Malta. Suleiman even launched his fleet into the Indian Ocean with competition against the Portuguese. He wanted to curb Portuguese expansion in the Indian Ocean, which threatened Muslim navigation, trade, and pilgrimage between India and Arabia, but he was less successful here. In 1538, the governor of Egypt, Suleiman Pasha, set sail with 74 ships from the Suez Canal and managed to capture parts of Yemen and the port city of Aden on the southwestern tip of the Arabian Peninsula from the Portuguese, but he couldn't dislodge them from their stronghold in western India. There was another attempt in 1552, but this also failed. Here, Piri Rais, an admiral who made the first map of the New World in the Ottoman Empire, set sail from the Suez with 30 ships to evict the Portuguese from Hormuz. He captured Muscat, which is in present-day Oman, on the far end of the Arabian Peninsula. He failed to take Hormuz and withdrew to the Gulf of Basra. Anyway, the Ottoman fleet traveled so far afield that some people wondered why the Ottoman Empire didn't colonize the New World. They were traveling throughout the Indian Ocean and could have practically set up a global naval empire. But after Suleiman, the extent that the navy travels contracts significantly, and the Ottoman Empire mostly hugs the shores of the Mediterranean and the coastline of Egypt and the Arabian Peninsula. Hey everyone, Scott here. One more brief word from our sponsors. 
Well, let's jump ahead to Suleiman's last campaign and his legacy. The Sultan's health started to deteriorate from the late 1540s when he was in his 50s. He lost his wife, Hurem Sultan, whom he loved more than any of his other wives, and he was troubled by the battle for the throne between his two sons. He devoted most of his life to just governing at the end of his life and lawmaking and being pious. But in 1566, when he was 72 years old, he set off for his last campaign against Hungary. Some thought that he wanted to do this to offset his failure of conquering Malta in 1565. Others thought that he wanted to finally capture the Habsburg capital of Vienna. But with this campaign, it wasn't quite clear what his target was. He set his sights on the town of Eger in northern Hungary, which the Ottomans had besieged in 1552, but failed. But then he changed his mind and marched against a fortress in southern Hungary near Mohac, which was the site of his greatest victory. But he died here on September 6, two days before the castle surrendered. His grand vizier, Sokolu Mehmet Pasha, concealed Suleiman's death until his successor, Prince Selim, was enthroned in Istanbul and acclaimed by the returning army in Belgrade. There's a lot to say about Suleiman's reign. His conquests substantially expanded the empire's territory from over 500,000 square miles in 1520 to nearly 900,000 square miles in 1566, growing the empire more than 50%. His conquests in central Hungary and Iraq were seized from his opponents, the Habsburgs and the Persians. Suleiman tried to gain world supremacy by battling Charles V until the 1540s, but when it became clear that one couldn't get victory over the other, they entered a stalemate. In later years, the sultan focused on just government. He streamlined the legal system, gave himself the title lawgiver, kanuni, and focused on the well-being of his subjects and built up mosques and other architecture in the capital and other cities. He also did his best to try to consolidate the administrative and financial systems. Later writers in the Ottoman Empire point to Suleiman's period as a golden age where justice was always executed, people behaved well, there wasn't the corruption of later years. That's definitely not true, but there was at least a lot of wealth going around at this period. But you do see systems getting streamlined, where instead of military fiefs, where military leaders can extract money from peasants, sort of like a feudal system, you have regular land and revenue surveys where there's a more streamlined tax system where it goes directly to the imperial center. But this system doesn't completely take hold until centuries later. But what's interesting about his legacy is the most influential advisor for Suleiman wasn't one of his grand viziers. It was his wife, Hurem, who was of Christian background from the Crimean Peninsula. Hurem had incredible influence on the sultan during their 40-year-long romance. The relationship itself was a little bit unprecedented because she was originally a concubine and then Suleiman married her, which wasn't precedented before him. A lot of the sons of the sultan, who they themselves became sultan, were the sons of concubines, not wives. And she had more than one son with Suleiman, which was also not precedented. It was a break with the one concubine, one son rule and with the practice by which mothers of princes accompany their sons to the provinces when they were appointed as prince governors. There was actually a rivalry between Hurem and Suleiman's first concubine, Mahid Evran, which initiated a process known in Ottoman history as the Sultanate of Women, where women are vying for control of the empire by ruling through weaker sons and husbands. And this leads to later queen mothers who basically run the empire. And you can see this with women like Kosem Sultan, who in the early 1600s really does run the empire, and she's the subject of a podcast series I did called The Most Powerful Women in the Middle Ages. So the emergence of favorites, both among the women of the sultan's harem and among the sons-in-law, the men married to the princesses, dates back to Suleiman's time. These processes changed the way politics was done in Istanbul. So lastly, Suleiman projected himself as the protector of all Islam. He called himself the caliph. And many Muslim scholars thought that the caliphate died in the 1200s when the Abbasid caliphate was destroyed by the Mongols. So what Suleiman did was restore religious buildings, such as mosques in Jerusalem, Mecca, and Medina, 
and built huge mosques in Istanbul that are still there today, like Suleimaniye in Istanbul and Salimiye in Adirne. So even though Suleiman's conquered territories were lost in later centuries, his buildings, his architectural projects, the legal codes that he left behind, the administrative codes he left behind, the many illustrated manuscripts he left behind, show us the wealth and splendor that the empire enjoyed at the height of its power under his rule. Now we're going to jump ahead a few more centuries and look at the reign of Abdul Hamid II. He's probably the last strong sultan in the Ottoman Empire. And he rules from 1876 to 1909. This is a time of incredible reform in the Ottoman Empire. This is a time in the modern era when Europe is much stronger. The situation is completely flipped from the time of Suleiman the Great, when the Ottoman Empire threatens to conquer Europe. Now Europe has passed the Ottoman Empire in almost every way. In technology, in military power, in global political power in soft power, cultural influence, where a lot of Ottoman intellectuals are learning French at this time period and dressing in more European fashions, copying European norms. Abdul Hami is trying to balance this, where he's trying to copy practices in Europe that are successful, trying to copy the technology, the military techniques, but still fashioning himself as the protector of Muslims around the world. So him trying to balance these things makes his rule as a sultan. Very interesting. So Abdul Hamid II gains power when he's about 34 or 35 years old, and he comes to power at a time of incredible political upheaval. He comes to power shortly after his uncle, Abdul Aziz, is deposed in a coup d'etat in 1876 due to the administrative and agricultural chaos happening at that time and the general inability of the Ottoman Empire to control revolts in the Balkans in the 1870s when there are all these independence movements breaking out. First it happened in Greece, then it happened in Serbia, later Bulgaria. Some liberal sultans tried to implement reforms and have parliamentary government, but the more autocratic Abdul Hamid had to take power and had to deal with ongoing sense of threats and response to modernizing influences and reforming influences and widespread revolutionary movements happening throughout the Ottoman Empire and really through the rest of Europe. Abdul Hamid traveled throughout Europe when he was in his 20s. During this time, he observed the progress in France and Great Britain and Prussia and Austria. He also engaged in agricultural ventures in the outskirts of Istanbul and learned the latest techniques in agriculture. When Abdul Hamid took the throne in 1876, his advisor, Mithat Pasha, envisioned a constitutional monarchy, but the new sultan opposed a liberal system like this. He did approve the introduction of a constitution and a parliament, but he changed the original liberal document into an authoritarian one. The sultan eventually dissolved the parliament and restored autocracy, and these limited constitutional reforms failed, partly because of Abdul Hamid's autocratic preference, but also because of the military defeat of the Ottomans against the Russians in the Russo-Ottoman War of 1877-1878. to The terms of the treaty ended Ottoman presence in the Balkans and established Russian predominance there, but eventually the Ottoman presence in Albania and Macedonia was restored, but it led to a more militaristic society. But there was a looming fear that the Ottoman Empire was going to be dissolved and partitioned among the European great powers. The Ottoman Empire was called the sick man of Europe by Europeans, and there was a question called the Eastern question of how do we break up the Ottoman Empire, and how should it be broken up, and how should these new colonies be divided up among Europe? Keep in mind this is the height of European colonization, where England, France, Russia, the Netherlands control basically all of Africa, a lot of southeastern Asia, and other parts of the world. Abdul Hamid also had to deal with bankruptcy conditions. Plus, there were hundreds of thousands of Muslim refugees flowing in from the Balkans and the Caucasus regions when these areas were conquered by Russia or declared independent. So these refugees were flowing into Anatolia. You saw the British invasion of Egypt in 1882, the Bulgarian annexation of Eastern Rumelia in 1885, Greek aspirations on Crete that led to the Greco-Ottoman War of 1897. So Abdul Hamid reacted against these by authoritarian measures like police surveillance, censorship, prohibition on public and private gatherings, 
and making it very difficult in the press to openly talk against the sultan. And also, the sultan really pushes to fashion himself an Islamic leader because he's using this ideology as sort of a weapon to strengthen his own rule. So he stresses that he's both the secular ruler of all Ottoman subjects as the sultan, whether you're Christian or Jewish or Muslim or whatever. But he's also stressing himself as the religious head of all Muslims everywhere as the caliph. So whether you're a Muslim in the Ottoman Empire or a Muslim in the Russian Empire or in India, the sultan has spiritual patronage over you. This leads to policies like only Qurans printed in the Ottoman Empire are allowed, not other Qurans, or building a railroad network to Mecca and Medina and providing transportation for Muslim pilgrims. Well, Abdul Hamid's efforts to stop these separatist movements led to brutal crackdowns. In Anatolia, Abdul Hamid mobilized Kurdish tribes against Armenian guerrillas and Armenian revolutionaries trying to have their own independent nation. In 1894, an Armenian revolutionary group staged an armed revolt, and this led to the massacres of tens of thousands of Armenians. Many researchers also think this paved the way for the Armenian Genocide of 1915, where up to 1.5 million Armenians were killed by groups like these. So the brutality of these events and international intervention on behalf of the Armenians and the corrupt character of the regime triggered opposition against the sultan by a dissident group known as the Young Turks. One organization in this movement, the Committee of Union and Progress, succeeded in infiltrating the military elite, leading to a revolt and forcing Abdul Hamid to restore the constitution in 1908. In this new regime, Abdul Hamid acted as a constitutional monarch. But when a reactionary rebellion broke out in Istanbul in 1909, Abdul Hamid was accused of being behind it, and this led to him being deposed that same year. He and his family were exiled to Salonika, and he was transferred back to Istanbul in 1912 during the First Balkan War to spend the rest of his life at the Beyler Bey Palace in Istanbul. So it's easy to look at Abdul Hamid as a strict authoritarian who's against all forms of progress. But in his own way, he tried to modernize the empire. A lot of modern infrastructure was built at this time. Railroad networks, telegraph networks, bureaucratic reform. During Abdul Hamid's rule, the bureaucracy acquired institutional features where you weren't admitted into the civil service due to cronyism or patronage, but promotion was based on objective criteria like exams and rules. Abdul Hamid created government schools at the primary and then the secondary level. Distant provinces were connected to the capital through the railway and telegraph networks I mentioned. And these telegraph lines extended from Albania down to Yemen. So all the empire's far-flung provinces were stitched together in a communications network. The judicial system was reformed in Abdul Hamid's rule, and there were more secular courts. Plus, you have a lot more literature being translated from French into Turkish. There's an explosion in printing presses. They might not be printing newspapers against the sultan, but you have a lot of literature being translated. You have encyclopedias being written as well. Ottoman poetry and prose grows at this time. So these changes have a profound impact on young people, resulting in the emergence of a Western-oriented generation who are dissatisfied with autocracy, who learn French and European languages, and they want a constitutional monarchy. So even though Abdul Hamid didn't usher in these changes, He cultivated a generation that ultimately would usher in these changes with the emergence of the Turkish Republic in 1923, a secular government based on the rule of law, even if it didn't always practice this. So he, in his own way, was the last powerful sultan. All right, well, that's a look at the sultan in this series. We're going to keep looking at different people in our series Ottoman Lives. And the next character we'll explore is the peasant. (laughs) 